the format that we're running, we thought it would be pretty interesting is for the people that have volunteered to give the flash updates for their particular project and are pretty doing pretty progressive and cool things in the space. Um, just gives them an opportunity to kind of let everybody know what they're up to, but also meet up organizers to see if there might be some level of content or, or product fit for what they would like to show their members at their community um, and to try and educate them around certain concepts, be it token engineering or token economics um, to anything around DAOs and other um, things that are happening in the space. So to kick things off, I'm going to start off with Jeff. Um, now, Jeff, I'm actually going to let you introduce your project, um, but he's essentially building the common stack. And after Jeff, we're going to leave it to Peter, Peter Pan, and then um, move over to Austin to describe the burner wallet. Jeff, take it away, man. Cool. Um, can everybody see my screen here? Yep. Do we, do we yes. see the presentation? I see common stack. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I just put together a couple quick slides here and I'll try to keep this brief, even though it is quite the uh, topic to explain in, in five minutes, but essentially we are uh, working to establish token engineering, which we want to use to scale regenerative community collaboration through commons based peer production. <clears throat> so I don't know if anyone that's a little bit to unpack if you've heard of uh, commons based peer production, we're basically looking to incentivize open source. Um, and provide sustainable financial uh, alternatives for communities to come together and, and solve their own problems. Um, so this is a, a collaboration between Giveth uh, and Block Science, at least uh, in the start, um, although we're hoping that it will include uh, multiple different projects and, and communities in the, in the crypto space and, and the token engineering and decentralized governance space uh, in general. Um, so to, to break this down at a very simple level, um, we are initially planning to build four components. Um, so these components, uh, one of them is the, the augmented bonding curve, which provides the sustainable funding. Uh, we have the Giveth donation app, which works as a transparent fund escrow. Uh, we have an, uh, kind of a novel governance mechanism we're calling conviction voting, which allows for like sort of continuous voting, continuous decision making on behalf of the community. Um, and then an operational analytics through a commons dashboard to feedback um, the usefulness of the work that's been done um, and basically allow the community to make better decisions um, as, as more work gets done in the community. Um, so one thing important to note is we're not uh, building a platform, rather we're building kind of a shared component library of simulated modules. So each of these component modules will be um, modeled and simulated using CAD-CAD, which is the um, complex adaptive system uh, simulation tool that came out of Block Science uh, just this year. Um, so we think this is going to be a revolutionary tool for design in the crypto space. Um, this allows us to test uh, wide ranges of situations in these systems before we put them into code and watch them fail in the real world. We can kind of understand these systemic failure modes before they happen. Um, so because of that, a large portion of the funds that we're raising with the common stack are going to open source and further the development of the CAD CAD tool um, and basically provide these components as pre-modeled, uh, pre-simulated, pre-tested um, and then any project that wants to use that bonding curve um, can take it off the shelf, tweak the parameters a bit and use it in their own project. Um, so ultimately we're looking to create um, a financial incentive for collaboration in development of token engineering. Um, we've noticed that there are a lot of different projects working in, in uh, different directions on token engineering, which is wonderful. Um, but there's also kind of this lack of um, uh, funding for R&D in that area. Um, a lot of people having to apply for grants um, and sometimes that uh, that market is a little slow. So we're trying to kind of create strap an economy onto uh, token engineering by creating a, a token engineering commons, um, which people can apply to with proposals, receive funding, do work, etc. Um, ultimately, the goal for the common stack, though, is, is realigning incentives and creating uh, new asset classes to enable community causes to solve their own problems, um, whether that's, you know. Um, 
Um, so all of this comes together in a little bit more sophisticated way than just the components that I showed above. Um, this is a quick diagram. I won't go into the details of this, but basically this is combining those four components that I showed earlier um, in a CAD-CAD system diagram. So all of these uh, arrows show actual uh, wiring and piping in the simulation. So we can start um, running through sort of parameter sweeps and Monte Carlo analyses and see where a system like this fails before we even start coding it up. So there's a lot to unpack there um, and I won't get into it in this uh, conversation, but um, there's more information uh, on our website. So we're looking for um, people to uh, donate and fund the build phase of the common stack. So we'll be ramping into a fundraise over the summer. Um, and basically we are looking for funding to build out these components um, and then these components can be used by communities whichever communities want to use them to uh, create and launch their own commons um, and we're probably going to see several uh, iteration phases we're not going to launch this whole system in one go we're going to launch it uh, component by component um, and allow communities to use these components as they see fit um, you can learn a lot more in our introductory article and also join our Telegram and Twitter uh, to join in the conversation. And there's lots more information coming soon. How am I doing on time? Can I take a couple of questions? Was there anything that uh, people- That was, that was pretty concrete. I think if, if there are any questions, I think we can allow for two to three questions, depending on how extensive they are. Anybody with questions? A few more people have jumped in. Maybe I'll put it back on the exciting diagram so people can. Right, I have, one, I have one question. I guess like, why did you decide to go infrastructure first versus application and use case first with building out the common stack? Um, so I mean, much of this, um, basically the, Components that we're building are based off of the research done by Michael Zargam at Block Science. Um, so he's working from a very deep uh, R&D level um, and building out these components. Is, it's more of a, a viable systems model. Um, so we're looking at building out these components piece by piece um, and tweaking them, but really making sure the mathematical foundation is solid. Um, and I think this uh, goes back to you know traditional engineering design when you're building a bridge you're you're basically assuring this the stability of that bridge because it's based on <clears throat> uh, conservation laws conservation of energy conservation of mass force equals mass times acceleration you know we can once we have these uh, conservation laws in math we can derive higher level mathematics you know calculus and so on to that relies on that conservation principle. So what we're doing with these components is defining uh, from mathematical first principles, some core relation between, for example, the supply and the reserve in a bonding curve, deriving uh, higher level mathematics off of those economic conservation principles, um, and then basically like building out the stack one component by component from there. Because we found that a lot of the narrative design when you start from um, the application from the user needs um, you make a whole lot of assumptions about how the system will will actually operate so we're we're bringing in several decades of research on multi-agent coordination problems and, and decentralized algorithms um, which which michael zargam has been studying for a long time um, and starting from those mathematical first steps and building the the basic components on top of that because we're hoping that we'll see more and more complexity uh, enabled through that kind of mechanism because we're starting from this uh, stable mathematical first principle. Did that answer your question or? Yeah, yeah, uh, I guess um, so. He, if he's been doing, I mean, he's, it sounds like he's uh, got a very deep R&D uh, background, right? Uh, just like spending a lot of time in that field and over the, over the long uh, R&D period that he's been working in, right, has, he, has his work found immediate impact uh, with real products and real people? Has that, has that value from R&D surfaced before? Um, just curious. For sure, for sure. So, I mean, he, he has a very interesting, um, you know, work, uh, work history. I mean, he was, he was work, 
working with uh, NASA and his undergrad to design uh, a putty for the space space shuttle. So this he was doing all sorts of simulation, all sorts of modeling. But I mean, the, the complex system design process, when we're looking at um, sending a space shuttle into space, there is a lot of uh, lower level design that turns into kind of higher level engineering that turns into, you know, an eventual product. So he's really working on that foundational level of establishing this uh, this engineering discipline, or or the even the token physics is kind of a, a coin he's a term he's coined that you're defining these sort of invariants in the system that will ensure the stability of the engineering that relies on those invariants. So it's kind of establishing a token physics layer on which you can build token engineering, on which you can build reliable user apps. And I mean, when we build um, complex systems in the real world, this is how it, we make them work in the long run. When we are when we're building, you know, massive bridges or space shuttles, we're relying on uh, these physical principles and these engineering principles before we get to a user application. So he's really looking at crypto economics as sort of a, a I mean, it's an incredibly complex system. You have all sorts of agents, you have all sorts of actions, you have, uh, you know, environmental factors to take account of. So this is as far as I've seen, the most holistic approach to trying to capture all of that um, complex information and model it. Um, and I mean, we're starting with the basics because we have to crawl before we can walk. We have to walk before we can run. Um, but I think there's some really interesting foundational blocks that can be built on here. Nice. Epic. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um... Yeah, I think, uh, Jeff, before we move on to Peter, um, where, where, which conferences will Common Stack be at that we could potentially look into meeting up with you? For sure. Um, the Berlin Blockchain Week is going to be a big one for us. Um, we'll be there at, uh, I believe Michael Zargam is speaking at Web3. Uh, we'll be speaking at the Token Engineering Global Gathering um, and perhaps another couple of events there. Um, but yeah, we have a distributed team, so we're not uh, based in any one location. And uh, we are basically ramping into this fundraise over the summer, and you should be hearing lots about us um, across a whole bunch of channels and, uh, and conferences coming up. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Peter. I believe you're going to be talking about Meta Cartel. Yeah, I guess. Um, so, hello, uh, I'm Peter from the Meta Cartel. And I guess the Meta Cartel, uh, we have a long story, right? But essentially, the Meta Cartel is a grant giving down, right? The aims to uh, fund, um, it's going to be begin funding and giving, providing grants to um, I guess projects on app, working on the application layer, right? And more specifically, we want to fund projects that are advancing usability and user experiences, like uh, understanding how we can push best practices or advance our understanding of how to build better experiences. And the other focus we have for the grants um, DAO essentially um, is just basically funding projects that are experimenting with new use cases, right? Um, how do we leverage Web 3.0 in new and interesting ways? How do we how do we use Web 3.0 to you know create interesting and unique experiences, otherwise uh, you know rendered unviable with Web 2, right? And I guess like the Meta Cartel, we started out uh, a while ago. We originally was a we originally were like a technical working group working on meta transactions, right? Well, you know, uh, meta transactions for those who aren't familiar, uh, it's it's a user experience solution that allows the user, right, who doesn't have any crypto, to write to the blockchain with a without needing gas, right? And so how this works is essentially, users uh, generate their own key and they sign a transaction where instead of actually um, needing gas and sending it to the blockchain, they sign a transaction and they send it to a server, a relay server, right? Which executes this um, transaction, which the user has signed on chain for the user, right? And effectively, what this enables, it enables that, it enables basically non-crypto people, Web2 users to interact with dApps um, directly without needing to onboard and hold any crypto. Um, and that was what initially the Meta Cartel came together to work on, right? Like, um, and the Meta Cartel originally was called the Meta Transactions Working Group until we had our first ever community call, which we had several selections to select from in terms of like, what should we call ourselves, right? And hence we were working on Meta Transactions, we decided to call ourselves our Meta Cartel. And since then, like we actually kind of like, uh, we came together to really solve the problem of like, how can we actually conduct meta transactions in a decentralized fashion, right? 
And this is all involved a bunch of crypto economic problems, which we wanted to solve together, but we didn't know how to solve them. So hence we collaborated together, right? And I guess late last year, we, as a community, we came together, well, led basically Tabuki, one of the projects of MetaCartel, right? One of the community members uh, made a breakthrough in the crypto economics and solved it, right? And um, not long after we had a spec that was um, uh, picked up by the community, kind of like verified that, uh, verified its like viability. And um, early this year, we actually started, we finished the implementation and we recently went for an audit, right? By, um, I, by I guess, Open Zeppelin, right? Or Zeppelin, where they audited um, the contract and the solution for decentralized meta transactions is ready to go on mainnet this year, right? I mean, like in a month from now. I guess so essentially, we were a working group, right? That came together to work on this um, UX solution and midway through, um, late last year, we actually solved it. So this year, we were basically a technical working group without a solution or without a problem to solve, right? And interestingly enough, it was a main, it was a huge meme, right? Like for most of the time, most of the time I was working on it, it was like just a meme because we had a dancing chili as a logo. We didn't really take anything too seriously, right? But interestingly enough, like we, you know, this e this year during Eve Denver, I wasn't actually at Eve Denver, but like people started asking, hey, where's our meetup, right? We, do we have a meetup? You know, people just wanted to kind of like, I don't know, like hang out with each other, right? And I think like at that point, I realized that the Meta Cartel had this really cool internal community going, right? And this like culture of like not taking it, itself too seriously, but also um, it had this like very, very collaborative nature um, embedded deep within it, right? Um, and it liked to work on things and shit things, right? It liked to actually do things more than talk, which interestingly enough, like uh, memes and memes and uh, software. I don't know. Like, you know, we either made memes or built things, right? And so I felt like we could, I felt like it was a shame to let this community go to waste, right? And just fade off into the, into the distance. So kind of like, um, yeah, we, we started looking for like a problem to solve. And one of the problems we realized is that no one out there, you know, has like, everyone's really out there focused heads down at infrastructure and no one's, uh, no one's actually really focusing on how do we grow the DAP developer community, right? How do we get people to build on top of these protocols and the, this like this oncoming wave of maturing infrastructure, right? Both on like layer two scalability and user experience, right? But also on like say the base protocol layer with like MakerDAO, Orga and like uh, Foam, for example, right? Like there's these possibilities that are enabled every day by the, you know, the, barriers that are, being put, that are being driven by companies, right? And no one's really like uh, exploring the, the edges of what's possible. No one's building on top of the, uh, this, these technologies, right? So that's what the Meta Cartel DAO is all about, right? How can we build a community and how can we, uh, how can we build a community focused on like building um, new and revolutionary products, right? On top of these web-free technologies and how can we actually, and I guess the DAO is like our first task, right? Let's pull together some funds and then like, actually fund people to build um, dApps and new use case, new use case driven experiments, right? Um, we're very focused on like use case first and like application and experimentation first kind of uh, approaches, right? Um, and we want to leverage as much existing infrastructure as possible because we just think there's too much to do, right? Um, like there's a lot of people working on low level protocols and low level research. We want to like balance that, right? And focus and, and make sure we push the frontiers of what's possible on the application layer. So I guess that, that's what the Meta Cartel DAO is about, right? But more specifically, I guess, the DAO came about when I was rejected from Moloch DAO. I became the first ever rejected member for Moloch DAO around April, right? And um, after I was rejected, you know, for various reasons, some political, you know, but we're cool. Um, like, you know, you know, after I was rejected, you know, it, 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 you know, I mean, and, you know, for, said, hey, why didn't you fork it, right? And I thought it would be pretty funny to fork it, being the first ever person to be rejected. And um, it became a thing. It was just like, it was just kind of a meme and we just went with it and I thought it would be, be pretty hilarious. But I realized that we could use this, this money, right, to do some good. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess. So we forked Moloch and essentially for those who aren't aware, right, Moloch's this DAO that was initially created, right, uh, it's like two years in the making, but it recently found it's um, a use case, right? Focused on funding core firm development, right? And recently, you know, it received around like 700K, nearly a million dollars from EF, the firm foundation consensus 
Vitalik and Joe Lubin, right? And um, they basically bought into the DAO. And how it works is that um, basically it's very simple. People put money in, they get shares, and these shares are used to vote on whether new proposals for funding should be, uh, should be approved, right? And these new proposals for funding basically mints new tokens, right? Uh, voting new to voting, voting tokens, which can then be burned um, with the, basically, uh, it can, these new tokens can be basically exchanged for actual ETH, right? The Dow Bank ETH, right? Um, and yeah, that's basically how it works. And it's very simple. It's very bare bones. And I almost say that's the saving grace, right? It's just like, it's very simple and it works. That's why we forked it, right? Alongside the meme of like me being kicked. But, um, and I think that we're going to see a lot of experimentation happen, right? Um, with Metacartel, uh, I mean, not Metacartel, with the Moloch DAO framework. And I guess it's just quick TLDR, like we, our approach is that we want to, we actually don't want to think too much about governance, right? We, we, do, we actually want to think, we want to spend most of our time helping DAP devs and uh, focusing on how to empower DAP developers, right? As opposed to spending time arguing and fluffing about with governance and talking about how, you know, how to design various systems and whatever. We, we want to decrease that and spend more time creating impact. And I always say that the DAO is more like a structure within the Meta Cartel, right? We're a community that's leveraging a DAO to coordinate funds, right? As opposed to being a DAO. We see it as a major organ of the community rather than being it, the community itself, right? So we're very much focused on like soft governance and um, uh, building up the right culture, right? Uh, culture of memes and um, and mate. Mate is this energy drink from Berlin, but you know, but like, yeah, um, M and M. <laughs> Any questions? Epic. <laughs> it was a good rant. <laughs> Epic, Peter. Um, would anybody like to ask Peter some questions about um, the medical tell? Don't be afraid. We do have time because uh, we just have uh, Austin to speak about Burner Wallet, and then we've also got James who's managed to dive in to speak about Arcanova as well. Um, yeah, Peter, just a quick question. I know we briefly talked about this before, um, but I think it might be interesting to everybody else as well. What is your long term vision with the Meta Cartel? Where, where would you like to see the Meta Cartel go, and what do you think is its potential, really? Right. I, I think that. I think the Metacartel DAO and the Metacartel itself is a huge experiment. Um, in one year, I think that even if all of, all of it, I feel like I'd be very happy um, in one year if everyone realizes how important the uh, application layer development is, right? I mean, like the end goal of the Metacartel is to find the next killer application, right? Um, it's just like, I think I'd be really happy in just like a year if everyone, real, uh, everyone starts building the application layer. And we play some part in that, right? We, if we play, if we become a stepping stone for the community to step in that direction. And, and I think that a big part of what we're, how we're gonna try to get there, right? Is by funding people and creating a community of DAP developers. Um, and yeah. Awesome. Um, I think we're gonna have to cap it there just for time. Um, and we're gonna hand over to Austin, who's going to be explaining the Berlin wallet. Go ahead, Austin. What up, what up? Uh, yeah, so just some quick background on me. Um, I'm the director of research at Gitcoin. I'm focused on onboarding and UX and adoption within Ethereum, both users and developers. I got into the space building like this decentralized Oracle and I kind of spent a lot of time in a silo by myself and what I learned from that is I, I'm first of all don't have the brains to build uh, a heady game theory uh, based <laughs> uh, application but uh, also you need to be able to uh, pop up and iterate a lot you need to be while you're doing heads down you also needs to need to be able to jump up and uh, get, get feedback from the community and find out what you're doing wrong and um, so then I started working on games and what I found with games, this is uh, Galias, one of my games that is uh, like hand painted with oil and very like token based and it 
you sail around, there's commit reveal for fishing and you're building and you're crafting. Uh, but what I found with this is uh, it was really hard to onboard users. Basically, you would you would have to have ETH, you have to understand what gas is, you have to have uh, MetaMask installed. Basically, uh, no one, I mean, some, some people came and played, but generally no one would play. And so uh, after creating another game called Paw Cryptogs, I started moving into kind of the the meta transactions and onboarding phase and kind of learning how we can abstract away some of this stuff uh, for our users. Along the way, I built uh, a few um, developer tools. One is called Clevis and the other is Dapparatus. I would find myself at hackathons and um, recreating a lot of the same pieces. So I built that into a developer tool set. And um, then I discovered kind of, uh, kind of put work of a lot of other people together to make this bouncer proxy idea and play around with meta transactions. And then we moved to like re recurring meta transactions for token subscriptions and a bunch of other junk. And then I kind of started pushing native yeah. meta transactions. If you're, if you're, Come on. <laughs> if you're redeploying uh, your contracts, you want to probably respect signed messages. Uh, a good a uh, good example of that is the new multi collateral die will be uh, respecting signed messages. So that means that instead of having to make a formal transaction on chain, you can just sign a message and send it to a relayer, and that relayer will put it on chain for you. Peter kind of alluded to what a meta transaction is, but that just means that you can send around die, or you will be able to by just signing a message. You won't have to have gas or, or any of that stuff. You can do it all kind of in a web 2.0 way. And I kind of started exploring at the intersection of mainstream adoption and emerging economies. And that's where I landed on the burner wallet. And the burner wallet is kind of like this mobile first. Um, if you think of like a hot wallet being something more like MetaMask, this is like a burner wallet. This is super ephemeral. We're keeping your private key in local storage. We're kind of exploring the, the spectrum of decentralization and security and kind of trying to navigate that in an intelligent way where we give users a really easy, quick, magic moment type experience first. And then as they get into the space and they use it and they create a narrative behind their account, then they're easier to educate about moving, moving you know, uh, up that, that spectrum of decentralization and, and getting more onboarded. So uh, yeah, basically you can send and receive. So if I Say I have one phone over here and I show the QR code to this phone over here. Uh, you, it'll scan in, you can see that those two match up and I can send like five cents or something like that. And uh, in five seconds, we'll see five cents show up over here. And that kind of gives you this, um, this sort of like quick. Um, uh, sorry, Austin, I think it's on yeah. your Google Chrome window that's showing. Are you trying to share another screen? Oh no. Yeah. So it's only this that's sharing, isn't it? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Oh shoot. Yeah. So I was sorry. Yeah. Uh, th th that'll work. <laughs> let's just kick through it. Um, well here, let me see if I can just share the whole, uh, boop, 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 doop, doop. like all of this right here. There we go. So that's like a whole window, right? I was showing Galias and I didn't, uh, yeah, you probably didn't see that either. Cool. Uh, so yeah, there's these two and I sent, uh, basically that you can send and receive funds quickly. Uh, we have a new Gnosis safe built in. So we have like a contract wallet where you can deploy a Gnosis safe on XDAI. You can deposit and withdraw funds to that safe. Um, this, this just gives you more permanence within your wallet and also uh, opens up a lot of new uh, fun ideas with how you can do delegated execution. Uh, I'm working with Gnosis to probably take this to the next step where we will have a Gnosis safe on the main net that is equal to or at least at the same address as the Gnosis safe on XDAI. So you will be able to kind of have your side chain contract wallet and your mainnet contract wallet, and they can move funds back and forth between those by just sending money to the bridge. But this will basically allow us to hand people, you know, a quick web wallet um, at an event, but then once they create a safe, they can slowly be uh, onboarded onto the mainnet with, uh, with a proper Gnosis safe on the mainnet. 
And uh, we did this at, let's see, we did the burner wallet at ETH Denver. There are like 4,000 meals purchased and about 40K off ramp to the food trucks. And it cost about a total of 20 cents to run that on XDAI. So that was a pretty good uh, success. We're kind of learning. Um, there's the, within the burner wallet, we're trying to figure out kind of educating the user. Can we, can we teach them about a seed phrase using emojis? Uh, I don't know, probably, maybe, I don't know. We're, we're exploring like using it as a, as a provider where you can uh, kind of have the burner sign messages from a third party website, um, wire integration. Obviously you could just drop a debit card in. Um, if you're interested in running an event, I have a, uh, in my medium, there is a uh, how to host a burner wallet event and you can kind of learn the basics of setting up a burner wallet event and what the, that looks like. Where'd I go? Here I am. Um, the burner modules is a new thing. If you're a developer and you're looking to extend the, the burner wallet, there's kind of this burner module section that makes it easy to drop in and, and add a React component on top of the burner module. And, and that is sort of playing toward this idea that the burner is more of a platform. So now that we have this kind of scaffolding for instant onboarding, uh, we, we're creating great games like emojicoin.exchange where I dropped uh, paper wallets on a classroom of students and immediately 80% of them were interacting with a smart contract by just tapping buttons on their phone. No app download, no seed phrase no owning ETH, there, there wasn't a, a lot of onboarding. They could just play this like shit coin trading game or emoji trading game where you would buy and sell emojis. We tried it a few more times on Twitter doing different kinds of onboarding and that's sort of what I'm exploring now is can we, can we build apps like prediction markets right on top of the burner and then, and then get people in and using them immediately, immediately and not having all the, all the onboarding but then we can kind of move them over to the mainnet eventually. So the Burner Wallet Collective is starting. I'm hoping to get more developers kind of helping me with the fundamentals of the Burner Wallet and then uh, allowing me to focus more on bringing, you know, apps and games to, to these new engagements and, and to, uh, you know, the, the ecosystem as a whole and then hopefully mass adoption to uh, everyone outside the ecosystem. Uh, I am Austin Griffith on all forms of socials. So uh, yeah, hit me up. Any questions? Impressive. Let's play the emoji games sometimes. It was so much fun. Yeah, we so we did the emoji coin game at ETH New York. And we'll probably do it again at another uh, event soon. What about ETH Berlin version of it? Maybe, yeah, we could put it in at ETH Berlin. Please. Austin, awesome. um, yeah. what, what do you want to solve next, right? Um, you're building a couple games now, but like, what do you think is the biggest barrier, next biggest barrier to say um, user adoption? Or we have a stage where we should probably start building some useful things, right? I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, Meta Cartels are focused on like, how can we use this, these technologies that we have now to build valuable products, right? Um, where, do you, where are you at, right? Where's Burner Collective at? So I think that um, 2019 being the year of the DAO and how DAOs are kind of a big thing. And for me, onboarding is a big thing. So I'm going to try to kind of mix those two things and build a, like a DAO based game where it's sort yeah. of like this blank canvas and uh, a DAO or multiple DAOs are used to sort of vote in the mechanics of the game. And then perhaps DAOs are also participating in the game. So it, it could be different levels of government could be controlling the characters within the game and how the game works. Uh, that's kind of like my in my inside game. So I sort of have these two ideas for, I, I think that, Onboarding and adoption, I think, will we'll start with gaming. And so I have these two ideas for two different games, one of them being this DAO-based game, the second one being more of a, a like zero barrier to entry type game where it kind of starts with signed messages. You do something very human, you sign it, and then that, that very human thing is used as almost a currency within the game to the upper levels. 
And I'm, I haven't really figured it out, but the point being someone could just get in and play the game, not have to worry about any other thing like gas or anything like that, but, but provide value within the game immediately. And the fact that they've provided value and created a narrative behind their account sort of helps educate them and drive them into the game. So there are a couple games, onboarding adoption. I think uh, uh, Christian alluded to the Web3 Connect. I, I think I want to, I'd love to see, uh, and I think Civil wants to build this too, and so I may be helping them build it, but something like Web3 Connect in combination with a post message iframe system where you can give to any third party website a JavaScript snippet where they can include a wallet on their site that then they can send stuff to to sign. And within that wallet, it can either be a burner wallet, it could be Fortmatic, it could be Portis. So, so using Web3 Connect, you establish some sort of Web3 login using a number of different ways. Like, you know, the old panel where you would have all the different social logins, like do you want to use Twitter or OAuth or Facebook? So I'd like to have that kind of login in combination with a uh, post message system that gives third parties a really easy way to integrate a wallet and make smart contract calls without having to be a super technical DAP developer. I think my time's up though. Thanks guys. Massive, well done. Awesome. Amazing, awesome. Um, and yeah, um, we're just gonna hand over to James Young, last but not least. Um, he's gonna be speaking about Arkanova. You've got the rest of the, the call to you. All right, uh, thanks everyone. James Young, I'm with The Bridge. Uh, so is James Duncan here. Um, I will go through a quick demo. Um, just to keep it uh, light and kind of quick here. Let me share my Quite screen. Easy. It's like a weight loss. Like. <laughs> exactly. All right. So uh, if you can see my screen, um, this is actually what we call the playground. So uh, with the bridge, what we are trying to do, similar to what Austin is doing with the uh, piece of onboarding in the burner wallet, is uh, we have an SDK. And what this SDK does is it allows for uh, developers to be able to quickly get or dApps or apps quickly up and running. Um, this SDK uh, allows an app uh, developer to embed a wallet uh, in their app. Uh, this playground is just a way to like poke around in the SDK. Uh, it's more meaningful for developers. On the left side in the, in the black, you see all the method names that we have uh, for the SDK. At the top, you see this HTML form, depending on what method you want to execute, uh, there'll be different parameters. And then you can actually see the code that you would need to write as a developer in order to implement this. Uh, you click run and it actually runs the code that you're seeing. Uh, and at the bottom, we have um, just output. So the console output, uh, you know, we have this eventing system uh, within the SDK, so you can listen for events. And then we have the SDK state, so you can interrogate the SDK to see like what's happening and what's going on. So when you first load here, uh, I will um, refresh, you get a device address, and this is just a, a public-private key pair that's in local storage, uh, very similar to the Bernal wallet. Uh, what you can do from there is you can create an account. And what this does is it counterfactually instantiates uh, a contract. So you get a contract address, but it's not yet deployed on the blockchain. So I can create a random ENS label so that when you uh, communicate with other people, you don't have to give them this hex address. You can actually give them an ENS name. Uh, you run the code and what happens, you see at the top now, uh, you have a lot more information. So I see the network that I'm at. I now have counterfactually instantiated my account address. So I have an account on the blockchain, an address on the blockchain, but there's no smart contract yet deployed. It's in the state that's created, it has zero ETH. We also in the SDK support state channel. So we have this notion of a virtual channel. Uh, we have this device state. So you have a key that's paired with the contract address. It's basically a sign-in key. And it's not yet coupled with uh, the account address because the contract has yet to be deployed. So uh, there's no way for the mapping between their device address and your contract address to exist on chain yet. And then you have your device address. So 
what I will do here is I will uh, take this account address. I will go to our favorite uh, web wallet. I will send it some ETH. Um, I'm on the right network, Coveni. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, send 0.1 ETH to this contract address. Uh, we have a listener. And so now you see that the account balance has increased uh, to 0 0.1. And once that happens, now we can deploy the account. So we have this ability uh, with the SDK for any relayer to relay uh, the or deploy the contract. And so when the contract is uh, deployed, the relayer actually gets paid back. So we need to run an estimate uh, account deployment cost. So we see at this moment in time, how much does it cost to be able to uh, you know, deploy this contract. We can either do it at fast, regular, or slow speed. Uh, I estimated the account cost. So now when I hit run, it should deploy the contract and then subtract out of my real balance to refund the relayer. So I click run. Uh, I have this hash. I can take this hash. I can go to uh, Covan, uh, just see when it gets mined. Uh, and so it's mined. And now you see that the balance has now been subtracted uh, because of the deployment state. And now you see that the account state of the contract is deployed and the device is associated or attached with this. Um, so this is simple onboarding, contract deployment. Uh, I can go through a bunch of other things, uh, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, and I don't have everything fully set up because you need two addresses to do virtual accounts and whatnot, um, but feel free to play around and poke around with it yourselves if you want to. Um, let me put this into the uh, chat window. Um, so you can play around with it yourselves. Uh, and uh, so we, we have the ability to add devices, remove devices. It's basically a multi-sig with yourself, essentially. So you can add and remove devices. We have this ability of, to do account recovery. So you can have social recovery. We have state channels and uh, we're going to next week have the ability for you to upload arbitrary code and like Stripe, just kind of attach it to your code so that you can like, you know, implement games or whatnot. Um, but really what we're trying to do and kind of the philosophy that we're testing out and the hypothesis is that in order to have mainstream adoption, we have to make the barrier really low for uh, UI UX. Uh, and what that looks like is just typical, you know, username login flow. So we have this uh, Amplify Auth demo. So AWS has a CLI called Amplify, and it allows you to really easily configure uh, user accounts and user management. And so what we're doing, what we've done here is we've just uh, forked that demo, and uh, we've just added in. I can show you here in my pool just account address and device address. So that's what you see here, account address and device address. Loop this in, this, if you fork this demo and you add incognito, these two special parameters, we'll have this uh, actual repo uh, available for a demo for people to take a look at. It's literally like less than five minutes and you're up and running. So what I can do here, I'll show you, uh, James demo one two three four five. Uh, James plus demo one two three four five at a fridge. I'm gonna sign up. Uh, once I've signed up, I can go to my email. I get a verification code. I go back. I confirm sign up. Uh, James demo one two three four five in my password. Uh, and then what happens is I'm logged in. And so I have a Cognito address. I, I have all this information. This is a demo that I'm working on. But essentially, the goal is to just make user onboarding just like Web2 style. Um, and so uh, right now we have, uh, in terms of SDK integrations, we have three apps that are going to go live with this SDK uh, within the next six weeks. And we have on board nine other apps that are in different phases of development that are uh, integrating this SDK. Um, yeah, uh, that's it.
That is amazing. James, I don't know if you want to have a look in the chat. There's a question from Mitej. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry um, for me to do multiple. But that is uh, mind blowing. That is mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> also, I have a question. What if I could use meta checks with ZK Reliport Semaphore or what existing privacy implements around mutate meta check that? Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, so uh, I've been talking with Aztec uh, in terms of uh, the SDK specifically, but your question has to deal with like meta transactions. Um, to be honest, uh, I don't know off the top of my head uh, an implementation. Uh, that could use ZK rollup uh, with meta transactions um, and or what existing privacy implementations uh, there are when it comes to meta transactions and relaying. Um, I guess what you could do is off just off the top of my head is like I know that Moloch uh, is uh, sponsoring kind of this mixer. Uh, you can just use uh, mixer addresses and then have them um, kind of relayed uh, just just for privacy concerns. Um, but uh, I don't know if that satisfies your answer, but um, that's kind of at the top of my head how I would kind of approach it from a pure, like, you know, let's just get it done right now, implementation. Are there any more questions? I can quickly go through here. Uh, so get some errors. Let me clear this. Um, so I, I can do a quick, quick I, I, this is a demo that uh, I'm working on. We're going to um, make this available. Uh, and I can, uh, if you hit me up or James Duncan up, we can give you access to the repo. Um, it's, this is a, a, how you would do, these are like the steps. Uh, and from a demo perspective that you would new, need to do for like account recovery. So in our SDK, we have like the social recovery mechanism. Um, and uh, there is two forms of recovery. There's recovery pre-contract deployment and there is recovery post-contract deployment. Um, and it, it goes through this. Uh, so um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a little afraid to, uh, to, to run all this because this is kind of fresh off kind of my development right now. So um, I'm not sure what state it's in, but my, okay, we'll go through this real quick if there's no questions. So I can get, always get the state of what I'm, where I'm at. Uh, so I can always interrogate and understand what, uh, what the user is. Uh, so there are two sets of users. There's a, a user on the Cognito side that's on the server side for the, the user profile and then what's stored locally. So you see that these two things, these two addresses match. What I'm going to do here is I can add a guardian pre-deployment. So what this allows me to do is that if you're an app developer and you want to handhold a user, uh, you can default and hey, say to them, hey, you know what, we'll be your guardian. And so in case you lose your keys or whatever, uh, we can get them back for you. So this is an example of how to do that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reset my SDK. So what this does is it's going to uh, deconnect, disconnect the uh, SDK from Cognito. So you see that there, the Cognito and the local addresses are actually separate. And what I've, hap what I've done now is I gener generated a new device address. So this is equivalent to saying like, I, I lost my device or I'm on a, a, a new uh, laptop or something like that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-deployment is ask the guardian to add this new key here. So I, I asked it to add a new key. And so now when I interrogate the SDK, I, I have three devices that are attached. I have this new device that I just requested for that the guardian said, okay. I have uh, the guardian address. And then I have also my original one. Um, and so uh, now what I can do is uh, I can then go through the contract deployment. So it's in the created state here. And this is very similar to what was shown in the playground. And so what happens is I'm going to fund this address with 0 0.1 ETH. And so I get that transaction hash, go to Covan. Okay, so that's been deployed. Uh, and once the indexer on the back end, 
picks it up, uh, you will see that it goes from, oh, what I now, now I funded the account. So now I can remove the guardian key, sorry. So now I've removed the guardian because now I, I have my, my local address uh, connected to the contract and now I can deploy the account. And so I funded the account and this is why I have a chain balance of 0 0.1 ETH, which is this amount of way. And now I've deployed it. Okay, so it's been deployed. So now when I refresh, I should see that I'm in this deployed state. Uh, and then I can now, uh, what we have is in our smart contracts, we have this notion of like contract extensions. So uh, while the, the main uh, account contract is very light and small, we have different extensions and we hope that other developers will add two extensions. So the first extension that we're showcasing is our recovery extension. So I can add a recovery extension, which means that I'm on chain going to connect uh, one smart my deployed smart contract to a recovery uh, smart contract. So the logic doesn't exist in my main account contract, it exists externally. And so that's been deployed. So I go to Covan and see, okay, so that's been um, mined. And so now here, uh, so I've added the recovery extension, now I have to configure it. So when I push this button, what's gonna happen is the, it's set so that it's one of one. So the guardian is the one that is going to do uh, the recovery. And so I can uh, estimate the recovery and then uh, do the recovery uh, and see when that, half this presentation is me going to Etherscan, waiting for things to get mined. Um, so now I've configured uh, the recovery. Now I'm gonna submit my friend recovery. Uh, what, what this means is uh, that I'm going to now um, ask, uh, or I'm going to, yeah, uh, submit my, ask my, uh, my recovery agent that I've defined uh, when I configured to be able to uh, uh, do the recovery uh, for me. So uh, I do submit recovery. Let's see if this works. So wait for that hash. Okay, that's been mine. The gas prices I've set on default are really high. This is why these transactions get mined so quickly. Uh, and so now I'm gonna reset the SDK again. So now I've, I did it, I reset my SDK one time to show how pre-deployment I was able to attach a new device address and do the recovery. Now I'm gonna reset my device again so that you can see post-deployment how you do uh, recovery. This social recovery is just one of one, so uh, I don't have to ask multiple friends of mine uh, just for the sake of brevity. Uh, and so I'm gonna reset my SDK, um, which is going to refresh the page. It's going to give me a new local address, uh, account address, and a new uh, local device address. Uh, and then what I want to do is I'm going to send gas or send ETH so that this new device can pay for uh, a submission to on chain to be able to start the kicking off their recovery process. So I hit confirm. Uh, I wait for that transaction to get mined. Okay, demos are going nice today. Transactions are getting mined really quickly. So now I start the recovery process. And so I tell the SEK, I wanna start this recovery process. I have one friend, which is that guardian. I have nothing in my signature because I've just started. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to just send gas to the guardian so that the guardian can now process that friend recovery request. All right, great. And then I'm going to now process my recovery. So on the back end here, let me start this up. Uh, the process recovery is gonna to go to the back end. The back end is where the guardian is and where the guardian's keys are. Oops. Let me refresh, let's see if that is gonna work. Process recovery, error not found. Oops, let me see. Oh, well, 
this is not working, but uh, if it was, I would get a signature back and then I'd finalize recovery. And then uh, I'm still, this is where, I, let's see if this will actually work. Cause I got a guardian signature. So, uh, so let me see if this will work. Um, so uh, before I do it, you notice that the Cognito, which is the server base account and the local account, they have different addresses. When um, I, let's see if this will, uh, I can't process the recovery. Let's see if the, part of the recovery works. No, I don't know if this is gonna work or not. Um, so yeah, sorry, uh, there's a bug. Uh, in the in the process recovery, but essentially, if it were to work, once I finish this bug, uh, then you would have seen that the cognito and the local uh, would have uh, been the same address. And this is how you do post account recovery. So, um, you know, we think that like social recovery is going to be very important for uh, for users. Um, and so, it's not just about like getting them onboarded. It's not just about layer two solutions where they have uh, these virtual channels where they can send for no gas uh, value back and forth, but also it, you have to allow for uh, account recovery. Um, Pre-deployment, post-deployment, we have the smart contract extension so you can extend logic. So you can, uh, based off of the basic account contracts, uh, be able to have any arbitrary logic that you want and the user gets to choose to extend these uh, as plugins or extensions. Um, and uh, what we are doing now, uh, working with uh, Peter and uh, Meta Cartel, uh, you know, with these, uh, since we have state channels, is looking into uh, different bridges. So uh, for example, we'll probably have a uh, connection from um, Ethereum to like, you know, Libra, uh, sometime in the next 30 days, uh, Libra testnet, um, and then doing uh, other really cool things when it comes to uh, state channels. Um, so there's this uh, paper called the Rainbow Network where you can do synthetic assets. Uh, so we're investigating that as well. Um, and doing little minor optimizations where you can actually uh, use the funds in your state channel to be able to uh, close, use the funds in the state channel to pay for gas to close out a channel. And then obviously we want to uh, integrate with um, gas station network when that goes live. So that's it. Hope I didn't bore too many people. My mind is completely blown. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Feel free to uh, check out the, the playground. Uh, it's working. We wanted to make sure that we got validation from projects that are actually going live. Um, you know, we are trying to set up uh, a similar scenario to what Austin was saying in terms of like getting app developers engaged and involved. Um, and so it's not just uh, allowing them to be able to implement this SDK quickly and easily, but also um, doing uh, what we're calling like app DAO experiments uh, with the help of Meta Cartel so that, uh, you know, let's say Meta Cartel DAO can initially fund uh, these apps and then an app developer could use uh, these app DAOs uh, as later stage funding mechanisms. These app DAOs are uh, going to use, uh, I think it's EIP 1843, the claims token. So you can actually uh, have, um, people that help contribute be able to have claims to revenue. Uh, what's important to us is uh, building out dApps that are uh, usable, that are generating revenue, uh, and and investigating how we can collaborate in a, in a decentralized manner. Um, so our main goal is just to make sure that uh, we do what we can to make it as easy as possible to allow developers to create apps uh, without the cognitive like overload of uh, you know Web three Web three provider on chain off chain transactions and things like that. Um, and so we make some compromises when it comes to uh, you know trustlessness um, but uh, we always allow the user to exit so at the end uh, our systems uh, can cater to someone that's like been in the cypherpunk movement for like 20 odd years like a Vinay Gupta uh, to like you know a brand new user who's never heard of crypto before uh, and this is uh, the balance that uh, we, we wanted to, to make uh, to make this as usable as possible. Amazing. Um, 
Cool. Guys, um, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask, but I think we are running over time, so we may have to move them over to the Telegram. Um, yeah, but we'll also be posting links to all the projects, I think as Florian mentioned in the chat, to all these projects as well. Um, so you guys can reach out and access them at a later stage. And then the recording to this will also be posted in the Telegram. Um, and yeah, I just want to say a big thank you to Peter and to James, to Austin and to Jeff for, for giving your time this evening. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure the guys that watch this um, at a later stage, obviously, because the time difference in Asia, those guys usually watch the recording. We've also got a couple of guys in Australasia Asia as well um, that will catch up on this and have something to say. Um, and thank you everybody for partaking in it this evening. Um, it's, it's really awesome. And i um, looking forward to the next monthly call. We'll have another potentially another collection of projects to present where, where you guys will hopefully be being involved with those meetups as well. Um, yeah, from here in Cape Town to everybody across the world, uh, good night and good morning. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Thanks awesome. for joining guys. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so much guys. Thank you so much guys for an awesome call. Bye.